Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Marisa Lagos. I'm a correspondent for Cal the California Politics and Government Desk at KQED, and I am very excited to be here virtually moderating this program. I am pleased to be joined today by journalist Carol Lenning to discuss her new book, Zero Fail, The Rise and Fall of the Secret Service. Carol's an investigative reporter at the Washington Post, where she's covered riveting news stories such as security failures and misconduct inside the Secret Service, as well as the U.S. government's confidential broad surveillance of Americans. She's won the George Polk Award for investigative reporting three times, won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for her study on the Secret Service delinquency, and is the co-author of the best-selling 2020 Trump expose, A Very Stable Genius. Incidentally, that's how Carol and I met at the last Commonwealth event with her and her colleague, Philip. Her new book, Zero Fail, The Rise and Fall of the Secret Service, further dives into the history and culture of the Secret Service. While the agency was a originally created to suppress counterfeit, cur counterfeit currency. Secret Service has since been the primary agency to protect prominent politicians and their families. Now, in the 21st century, it's become better defined by its failures to avert break-ins at the White House, armed gunmen firing at government buildings, prostitution scandals in Colombia, and many other instances of negligence. It almost doesn't sound real, Carol. <laughs> Carol <laughs> reveals the Secret Service toxic work, work culture, outdated training techniques, and deep resentment among the ranks within the agency's leadership. So we obviously have a lot to discuss in the next hour. And if you have questions, we would love to hear them. If you're watching along with us, you can put them in the text chat on YouTube. Uh, we will get to them throughout the hour. After that very long and lengthy introduction, Carol Letting, thank you for joining us. Welcome back. Well, Marisa, I had such a great time last time we got to talk. And I wish I could have stayed in San Francisco longer and hung out with you. Um, that, of course, when I was ready to publish this book, I you were the person I wanted to talk about it with. And the Commonwealth Club is like, what a thought leader location. I feel honored to be here. Um, my book is uh, long uh, and sometimes really depressing and sometimes a little, a little terrifying, especially in recent weeks and, and years. Yeah. But, um, I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's. I was joking with you before. It's a bit of a tomb. It's very long, but it's because this is such a long storied agency um, and you really delve back. And I don't want people to be turned off from reading it because it's actually like a fun read. I mean, mostly it's a little depressing, too, but mostly um, and you really just detail stuff with such it's, it's very vivid. So I want to start at the beginning because of that, because I think understanding how something created to uh, investigate counterfeit currency ended up being like the front line between, you know, arguably the most powerful person in the world. So talk a little bit about, I guess even maybe not why there was a secret service. Why wasn't there one to begin with? Right. Why wasn't this something that everybody thought was important? You know, three presidents had to be assassinated before the country and the Congress started to say, maybe we need an actual protection team, a real institution that protects the president. It was because, you know, America, especially in its fledgling years, um, was rejecting everything about the royals, right? It, it was an every man country. Uh, it was the people's house. It was the people's government. And the idea that the principal leader of the country elected by the populace would have to protect himself from the populace and use taxpayer money for that was sort of anathema. And a lot of presidents resisted it, resisted the way it looked, resisted it uh, because of the expense. And finally, after McKinley was killed in Buffalo, the Secret Service decided, uh, or rather, the entity that was investigating uh, counterfeit uh, notes, the Secret Service at the time, was deputized to actually start formally protecting the president. And I mean, are they also, can you talk a little bit about the scope of what they do, you know, or, or how it developed over time? Um, because the president is obviously not the only important figure in the government that you want to protect. Absolutely. In fact, that goes to the heart of the, of the problem that the Secret Service has now, right? These agents risk their careers to tell me these secrets. 
because they feel like a president is going to be killed on their watch. That's how strained and shortchanged and overworked they feel. The mission is enormous. It start, you know, you and I, and certainly I, more than 10 years ago, before I started covering this, most in the public see the Hollywood image. It's a guys with those sunglasses you can't see through, trim, fit, suits, earpieces, not talking to anybody, um, very serious, buttoned down, protecting the president. That's who we think of as the Secret Service. But the Secret Service has a ton of other jobs. Um, they just as their legacy mission, investigating uh, financial crimes. So that now is like electronic digital crimes, cyber hacking, cybersecurity. They also protect 40 other people besides the president, the president's grandchildren, the, pres- the vice president's stepchildren, uh, several cabinet members and security top security officials. They also protect, as a result of the 1990s and President Clinton's order, they also protect things that could be the target of terror. So a Super Bowl or the Olympics or um, any other massive gathering of people that could be targeted. That's a lot of jobs. Plus, they also protect the United Nations General Assembly. The Secret Service is responsible every time a very big deal foreign dignitary lands on U.S. soil. We at at the Secret Service, forgive me, the Secret Service has to make sure that they stay safe on the U.S. soil and they get home alive. It's a lot of of jobs Um, and actually right now far too many for them to actually accomplish. I want to dig into some of, you know, the history and the things you detail, but can we go back to this whole like cyber fraud, financial crimes? I mean, don't we have, you know, the FBI, the DOJ, like all these, why are they still in charge of that? Unfortunately, the secret service, you know, is, is a tradition bound place and a lot of alums and a lot of senior, senior leaders believe well, this is part of the Secret Service's history, and we're not going to give that up. Mm -hmm. There's also a financial incentive. Um, Many Secret Service agents, if they serve 20 or 25 years in the job, get a pretty generous pension, appropriately so, when they retire, uh, just like an FBI agent. But many of them find a very lucrative second career in finance and security for finance firms. So, Losing that financial investigative work makes them uncomfortable, uh, both for history reasons and for wallet book, wallet and pocketbook reasons. That makes sense. So like, you know, territory and money, always, always big (laughs) driving forces. Um, Well, you know, you mentioned the McKinley assassination and that there had been, uh, you know, two others. So I I do want to bring us up to JFK and sort of I feel like that's a real core here, but between McKinley's death and, you know, one of the most horrific and famous days in American history, can you just bring us up to speed on like how the the service developed in its earlier days? You know, it really wasn't um, uh, one person who I really respect a great deal told me that he felt that the Secret Service was kind of like a mom and pop store. There wasn't a policy, there wasn't a a strategic mission, there wasn't a delineated description of like exactly the job skills and and the security protocols always in those days. I mean, they basically were men who had served in the military honorably and came back from war, often the Korean War, other wars, and, and became presidential protectors. But it didn't have a routinized or rigorous kind of backdrop for so it was until until this tragedy of Kennedy's assassination, it was a very, very basic um, gut instinct kind of an operation. So uh, Kennedy gets elected. He is, you know, this playboy, very handsome, very much enjoyed. It sounds kind of reminds me actually, and I know he would love to hear this, but of the way our current governor likes to interact with the public, um, or at least did before he was facing a recall. Um, (laughs) But it sounds like leading up to what happened in Dallas, there was sort of this series of overstretching of the secret service. They were overworked. They were traveling like crazy, Um, like lay out the state of play when, you know, they touched down at Love Field. 
Well, I, I didn't know this until I started researching it for the book. Many people have written beautiful and gripping and chilling descriptions of Kennedy's assassination. But from the perspective of the Secret Service agent, I had not realized how exhausted and run ragged they were in 1963. In fact, their director, this is just a small little fun fact, their director, Jim Rowley, is um, the grandfather of a former uh, assistant secretary of state, whose husband is now the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Wow. James Rowley um, was begging President Kennedy and Congress to let him add more staff because they could not keep up with this high-flying president. He was young. He was full of vim and vinegar. He loved to travel. He loved to mix with people, with or without his agents. He just would pull plow right into a group of people and start shaking their hands. It's just this natural instinct, uh, as, as unsafe as it was. But mostly it was that they were always traveling. Um, they were going to Hyannisport. They were going to Palm Beach. Sound a little familiar? They were always on the road, and he was loved campaigning. That was his natural state, even though he had a lot of pain. So they were exhausted. And in those days before he restarts his campaign in the fall of 63 for re-election, um, they are literally showing up at their own personal homes, putting out a, a bag full of dirty laundry and picking up a new suitcase from their wife and heading back to headquarters to get on another plane. They're barely sleeping in their own home because it's just too much turnaround. Um, that's that's kind of where they were at that point. Well, not just not barely sleeping in their own home, they're barely sleeping at all because they're like traveling so much. Um, so I know, I mean, this has been well-trodden territory, but I mean, it seems to me reading your book that it was almost this perfect storm of like, so you start off with, they are just so burnt out and tired. Then there are the choices that were made by individual agents the night before. Walk us through that. <laughs> Yes. It's funny how history kind of repeats itself. Um, and this one was really a sad one. Agents, and now keep in mind, we America was a much heavier drinking culture in the 1960s. And um, the agent's way of blowing off steam and relaxing after a, you know, 26 mile walk <laughs> uh, through Tampa, for example, or a 22 and 10 mile jog through the streets of Miami. And the nights before in Fort Worth and other cities in Texas, um, their way of blowing off steam was like, let's go get a drink and let's go get a little food. Well, the night before they arrive in Dallas, they're in Fort Worth and they go to this sort of beatnik um, bar where women don't, the waitresses don't wear a lot of clothes and the alcohol drinks are like fruit juices spiked with gin, al gin, um, forgive me, grain alcohol. Mm. And they can't find any food, but they do find beer and grain alcohol cocktails. They stay up, some of them, till 2 and 5 a.m. in the morning. These are the agents that protect the president the next morning at you know 8 a.m. So they haven't had a lot of sleep. And although it's unclear that they were hammered, they had certainly not had sleep and had had alcohol until the late hours of the morning. Um, they head off in a plane for a 23-minute flight from Fort Worth to Dallas uh, and begin their motorcade towards Dealey Plaza. And even before this, though, you detail that there had been some intelligence that, I mean, any president is going to receive threats. Um, we'll, get, we'll get to how much those have increased, <laughs> depending on the president and I think with social media and other things. But um, it, it wasn't as if there was no indication that Kennedy was being targeted at this moment, right? Absolutely right, Marisa. It was it was really actually to me, to my mind, the Secret Service of today would have been all over this. The Secret Service of then um, wasn't paying very close attention. There were a series of threats against President Kennedy and a specifically articulated plan that an FBI informant passed along to the Secret Service about a man who was a white supremacist or a leader of a white supremacist network who was describing how they were going to kill Kennedy from a high building during one of his motorcades because he, you know, traditionally did travel in an open limousine as he did that day. Um, it's unclear why the Secret Service didn't focus more on this other than they were just, you know, spent. Yeah. 
Um, and so, I mean, we, we all know what happened, but one interesting detail and something that I think really haunted both Jackie Kennedy and, and the, the driver that day was, you know, the shooting begins and he slowed, the, the driver of, of the president slows down, right? I mean, I don't know, when you think about this with all the research you've done, like, is that the moment that you're like, oh man, they could have stopped this? Or is it everything we've talked about? I do have to say that I think Bill Greer, the agent driver, tapping his, the brake of the limousine as they hear shots ring out. Now, remember, some of them thought it was a firecracker. Some of them that had been in combat knew right away right. that that's a gun. Um, but they're, they're re all of them, all of their reactions were a little slow, other than Clint Hill, who as soon as he hears it knows what it is. He's Jackie Kennedy's agent and, and famously runs and clambers to jump onto the back of the limousine, but arrives with the third fatal shot mm -hmm. um, when parts of the president's brain uh, have fallen on the back of the limo and in the seats. And Jackie Kennedy is, you know, instinctively leaning over the back of the limo, trying to collect these pieces to put him back together again. Just a heartbreaking scene. But, but the instincts of so many other people are bad. Agent Greer taps the brake. That third shot, per you can't know. Right. But he would, Lee Harvey Oswald would have had less of a chance to make a kill shot on the third go round. And the other agents who turn to the right over their shoulder to see what is that, Secret Service agents don't do that anymore. I mean, as soon as they hear anything, it's, it's seconds that have to um, be used efficiently to cover and evacuate the president. I mean, two things strike me as you're talking. One of them is just that one of the reasons Hill and others weren't standing on the back of that limo is that the president himself had told them, like, you're too close to me. The people need to see me. I'm never going to win election reelection if people think I'm, you know, behind a fortress. And I am guessing, having covered a lot of politicians who may not have Secret Service details, but who have in California, the California Highway Patrol, you know, everybody's got their own. That, that is not an unusual tension between a politician and a security detail. Um, do you think it was just like, it seems like they really did defer to Kennedy. Like, is that normal? Or do you think that, that you know, generally security has gotten like less deferential and they think there's a real threat or, I mean, how much do you make of that? So, I mean, over history, that tension is just a constant between a White House and a Secret Service. It's just a constant battle, sometimes polite, sometimes not. Yeah. Because, and at that moment, they were deferring to President Kennedy. You know, they hadn't lost a president. <laughs> um, they were deferring to him and they weren't thrilled about it. And they wanted to be on the back of those running boards of the limousine because they wanted that reaction time. So they knew what was right, but they let, uh, his decision rule. And that would happen again and again. I mean, I, again, s speeding forward yeah. a little bit, President Clinton, first real TV president, he's trying to, and his White House aides are trying to push Secret Service agents away at a distance, um, which is bad for duck and cover. It's bad for cover and evacuate. He was trying to push them away because he didn't want them in the camera shot. You know, you want to have the president look like an everyman. He doesn't need protection from his people. But most most importantly, it's him strong, alone, not these other distractions. Um, the same thing would happen with Donald Trump. I mean, his agents were really worried that he was going to get hit by a sharpshooter at his golf course because he wanted them away from him. He wanted to look strong. He didn't need protection. Um, the problem was if, you know, telephoto lenses could shoot the president on his golf course while he was golfing, we all know that that was possible. Then that same kind of um, device could be added to a long gun. Right. And this distance is, is is one of the things the Secret Service really drills in that you have to be close in order to help. You probably saw during Trump's campaign, which was a little bit of a chaotic campaign in 2016, um, people were rushing the stage so often and agents were there in a whip and uh, grabbed the president multiple times and, and took him off stage in less than probably 40 seconds. Yeah. Uh, so pretty important. I was just thinking about who was it? Uh, Jill Biden's uh, 
moment on the campaign trail too, where she stopped somebody from rushing the stage. And I think Kamala Harris's husband has had to uh, do that, which, which does, and I want to come up, you know, into Obama and, and more recent years soon, but it also just strikes me that like, it, at its core, it's almost an impossible job, right? Because unless you're going to put the president in the you know Oval Office 24 seven and never let them interact with the public, there's going to be risks. And, and, and the whole sort of construct of politics, whether it's rallies or speeches, I mean, is putting them in a vulnerable position. Does the, I don't know, do, do the agents you talk to ever kind of like have to grapple with that? You know, they joke. I mean, they have a bit of a gallows humor like journalists, you know, um, but they also kid around about how the Secret Service is ultimately a lot of rush, 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 hurry, 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 wait, 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 wait. You know, the job can be intensely dull because you are waiting for catastrophe and you've got to keep your antenna up at all times. And yet, nothing bad happens. So you can become numb and you can become dull to this, but you raise such a good point, Marisa, about the, the impossibility, you know, they always talk about mitigating risks, you know, how are we going to mitigate the risks? So they try to in, uh, you know, a, a campaign stop, they make sure there's no kill shot, nobody like Lee Harvey Oswald ever again, no way in which there's a place from which someone can shoot at the president, no way somebody can drive up with a truck bomb, no way that somebody can accidentally or intentionally um, release something that's toxic that can get to the president. But ultimately, you're mitigating risks. Here's a risk that Secret Service really didn't like, and they were beside themselves about it, even though they loved this president, adored him, George W. Bush. When his uh, chief of staff and his White House team arranged for him to land in a fighter jet on an aircraft carrier for that Mission Impossible moment, oh, the agents were so angry. They're like, really? We need to do that? If, If the jet had not caught the wire on the aircraft carrier, we wouldn't have a president. You know, it was so, in their view, such a crazy risk. Like unnecessary. Yeah. yeah. And also, I guess maybe in hindsight, Bush might wish he had never done that too. That became like they, they could have saved line. him. They could have saved him something if they'd listened to him. To them. So, I mean, coming into more recent years, I mean, uh, clearly the Kennedy assassination just rocked the service. And it really, I think, sounds like, you know, it, it, it was... It was a turning point. Um, I mean, how do you how, how do you kind of account for what happened then? I mean, maybe moving into more like 9-11 Clinton or pre-9-11 Clinton Bush years, like how what was the state of the service and what did they make a lot of changes? You know, they may. It's interesting. I view the Kennedy's assassination as the moment of the the worst tragedy you can imagine for the Secret Service. Like, right. The America, uh, the American people. Be, Anyone who was alive, no matter how young, remembers that moment, their mother crying, their teacher crying. If you're a little kid, you even remember that at the time. Um, But it was such a gut punch for the Secret Service. I mean, alcoholism and suicides resulted from this tragic failure, which you could argue they they deserved. And you could also argue they weren't totally prepared um, to protect the president in that moment. So that's something horrible that happened and they studied the heck out of it. But they also, some amazing things, a wonderful thing happened as a result of this. And it was that James Rowley, the director, got 280 more Secret Service agents and investigators. He got computerized investigative systems. Computers were just beginning then. Um, He consulted with IBM and they start analyzing and keeping track of those threats that like the one that came in of the white supremacist in Florida. Um, They they start developing all sorts of attack on the principal training, which is, again, that hair trigger reflex. You hear a shot, what are you doing? You see this, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Because later that will, that will prove really important. So a ton of improvements and changes were made Uh, as one agent likes to say, you know, all of the secret services improvements are born of blood. They kind of reactively prepare for that thing that just happened. Um, but they really rebuilt and remade this agency and they were vindicated. Um, I was going to say, I guess I shouldn't skip too far forward because we have a couple other 
assassination attempts in the meantime. Yeah, yeah th- that's okay. I can mean, I can summarize it. They, they were vindicated when Ronald Reagan was nearly killed. The split second reactions of those agents. I mean, Tim McCarthy, uh, one of the supervisors, throws up his chest and his arms to take incoming bullets from John Hinckley, who's standing about 11 feet away from President Re- Reagan as he leaves the Hilton. Uh, he happened to sneak into a group of cameramen who were, you know, filming the president's departure from the Hilton. And, um, you know, McCarthy took the bullets. We, we talk about agents taking a bullet for the president. Well, McCarthy literally did it and not like accidentally did it intentionally threw himself in the path of a bullet. Um, then there's Jerry Parr, his detail leader, who was behind the president. And again, that first sound of shot, no looking over, like in Daly Plaza, no looking over the shoulder, took his hand onto the president's shoulder, pushed him in to the waiting limousine about three steps in. The president's jaw and rib bone hit the bottom of the limousine back seat so hard. And of course, then Parr jumps on top of him so that they can leave. Um, so hard that the president thinks his rib has been broken. Another agent behind Parr, uh, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, Roy Shattuck, folds up Parr's legs and slams the limo door. I mean, could have broken his legs, but just folds them up so that they can leave. And they, the agent is afraid that he's driving over um, Timmy. Uh, he refers to him as Timmy, which is Tim McCarthy. He's seen McCarthy fall, and he worries that he's driving over him he doesn't know but he has to speed away um because he's got the president in the back seat um do i mean i I, sorry kind of going back what i was thinking about you know after jfk then obviously bobby kennedy um can you talk a little bit about how you said that they cover you know the sitting president and their extended families but don't other like former presidents get protection as well. How does that change after Kennedy or was that something later on? Yeah. Again, born of blood Um, after Robert Kennedy is killed in Los Angeles while campaigning for president and looks like he's on his way to winning um, after he is, is shot that night and and dies early the next morning. Um, In the middle of the night, President Lyndon B. Johnson calls Director Rowley and says, I don't care what the rules are. I don't care what I have to do. But right now, send details of Secret Service agents to every single presidential candidate. They're going to live with them for the rest of this year. Um, And and a wonderful agent that I interviewed who um, has since passed away, Bob DeProspero, was one of the first agents called Uh, by Director Rowley and was assigned, oh, I'm going to forget the wonderful governor um, of New York who became a vice president. Anyway, he shows up at his house in Fox Hall in Washington, D.C. and says, sir, I'm I'm here to live with you for a little while. And that is a surprise (laughs) to the candidate. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Obama got, I think, protection earlier than any other presidential candidate. Um, But by the time that happened, you really detail what 9-11 did to the service. So I think I mean, then that, you know, even though the White House was ultimately okay. I mean, that was a huge moment for this agency as well. Absolutely. In fact, if I had to pick like the four biggest moments, my book is broken up into four um, parts, but the four biggest moments, like pivotal moments for the secret service are Kennedy's assassination because of the rebuild. Um, Reagan's near death because it vindicates that rebuild. Uh, 9-11, because it lays bare both the incredible heroism of the Secret Service and and some of the things that aren't working exactly perfectly. Uh, and it starts a down, that 9-11 starts, on, uh, sadly, a downhill slide for the Secret Service uh, because we are fighting terror in the skies. And then the fourth, of course, is, is now where the agency is both amazing because of the people, but really at its nadir as an agency that's that's ready for the mission that it has. Yeah. So back to 9-11, here's what they did right. Um, incredible ba- bravery. There is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell it backwards though, and here's what they did wrong. 
We all remember the two towers being hit in New York. When the second tower is hit, it's presumed, oh my gosh, terror attack. Everybody knows it. Um, from the police chief to the first grade teacher, everyone knows something's wrong, really wrong. And unfortunately, when that second plane hits the tower, the FAA realizes, a senior supervisor in the FAA realizes, wait a minute, we got two more planes out, not talking to us, but generally trending towards Washington, D.C. And they're not responsive. So we have to presume they're hijacked. More terror on the way to Washington, D.C. They reach out to a liaison at the Secret Service, a very senior supervisor named Nelson Garabito, and they relay this emergency to him. Two planes coming at you, not talking to us, 20 to 30 minutes out. For some bizarre reason, this message of warning that the White House could be a target, the Capitol could be a target, they don't know. This does not get passed to the rest of the Secret Service leadership and team on the White House grounds. Huge, huge, huge failure because Vice President Cheney at that moment is in the White House. And in the chain of command, if President you know, Bush is killed or if something happens to him, Cheney has to run the government. He's the new president. So it's not like an academic exercise anymore. It's actually truly a crisis. The, the, the anxiety about the terror attack leads the chief of staff to tell the president, who is then in an elementary school in Tampa, to just stay put, sit through the class while they're reading a poem about a goat, story about a goat, and then sit in the school a little bit longer so he can make an address to the American people and kind of stop any potential panic. Well, there's something super wrong with this which is the Secret Service wants to get him the heck out of there. They don't know if a plane is coming to the elementary school. They don't know what kind of attack is coming. They have no idea, but they know that it could. And yet the White House wins that argument and they keep President Bush at that school for a half hour where he has a bullseye on him. Cheney, meanwhile, the other potential president of the day, has a bullseye on him. And he is not moved until three to five minutes before the inbound plane is flying over the treetops of downtown Washington. His agent bursts into the door in his White House office and says, Mr. Vice President, we're leaving now. The Vice President starts to say a few things and he goes, no, 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 now. Grabs his belt loop, pulls him out down to the tunnels. Another wonderful heroic moment, but also a, a failure because no one realized that a vice president, no one thought about the fact that a vice president might need to get to the presidential emergency operations command center, the bunker below the building that's, you know, bomb proof. Nobody realized that that might be necessary or, or really thought ahead. So the vice president detail agents don't have the special key to get him into the presidential emergency operations center that's, you know, underneath the East Wing. And again, if, if things had just been a little bit different, if the plane hadn't crashed into the Pentagon and it st instead had been coming for the White House, you know, Dick Cheney might not be alive today. I, I'm curious, like, <laughs> it's, you know, we had hit already the, the landing on the aircraft carrier and which is clearly like a political stunt. I mean, Bush got a lot of flack for continuing to read that book, but in the moment, I mean, that's literally what his staff told him to do, right? Yes. I mean, Andy Card, who, uh, you know, has a, a lot of credibility and a lot of uh, both strategic and political wisdom, his view was, we are not going to start uh, a, a panic on national TV because the president was being televised as he's reading right. with the children. Um, and, and he felt strongly, and he did, that we better communicate now that now, several minutes later, after the second tower is hit, and, and, you know, every jaw is dropping to the ground across America and across the, the world. We have to, as, as the White House and the president, have to communicate something to people to, to give them 
spine and and a feeling of security. Mm-hmm. So he trumped, uh, no pun intended, the Secret Service. And in the end, that risk turned out to be okay right. because nobody was targeting the school. I mean, it does speak to just how challenging it is because like those are like you know, keeping a nation calm is a security question as well, right? I mean, you do have this, I mean, that, and that was such an unprecedented moment. Um, so this is relevant from the from the audience. We say, how much authority for the, do the agents have to override a president's decision when it comes to his safety? Uh, I have had, a, you know, different agents will give you a different yeah. answer. I mean, some agents have said to me, I would have, you know, thrown down my commission book, which is sort of like their, their badge. I would have thrown down my commission book and said, you know, you want to fire me? Go ahead. But we're not doing this. Now, yeah. usually they have their fights, not with the president. They usually have their fights with the White House staff who want like a big glowing backdrop with nothing behind it. And the agents are like, we have to bring in some tractor trailers behind it to make sure nobody can shoot the president from behind. Um they always are arguing over optics and safety, optics and safety, optics and safety. And other agents have gone along with things that their colleagues thought were abhorrent. So it really depends on who you ask. But some people have been willing to lose their job. And when they say that, they never really lose their job. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and obviously, because I watched like the West Wing so much and other um, dramas, you know that in the moment, to your point about Dick Cheney, they'll generally just like manhandle, or the Reagan situation, they'll generally just manhandle the principal if it comes to that, right? Like if they're actually well, under fire. Absolutely. Although there's a uh, not so funny and and to me a really spine tingling scene involving Vice President Pence, which we can get to later if you'd like. But um, his agent comes to him three times when he is evacuated off the Capitol, uh, off the Senate chamber, and says, "We got to get out of here. People have pierced the building. You're not safe. Your family's not safe. We are going." And Pence is directly telling his detail leader, no, 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 I need to stay here, certify the election. Um, The three times that the agent comes to him are very close in minutes. (laughs) Pence Pence turns him down two times. And the third time the agent says, oh, no, no, we're going. And uh, just like with Cheney, hand on the shoulder, let's go. What do you make of that? Like, why do you think Pence was so adamant? Do you think he just didn't realize the threat? Oh, he had to know the threat. I mean, people were chanting, hang Pence outside. Um, People were kicking doors, not in, but kicking them to see if they could break them in. He was in a hideaway off the Senate floor with his daughter, his wife, uh, his brother, um, and and several detail agents and staff. And outside the the very large windows of that office was a noose, uh, a faux noose that had been erected and it had Pence's name on it. Um, So he had to know that there was danger, but he was insistent that he was going to finish the job. Nobody was going to chase him out of the Capitol um, in his, you know, formal role, certifying the election of the next president. I must have made Trump very happy. Um, I am getting some audience questions. I want to remind you that we, um, those are open. Please put them in the chat or comments and they will get passed on to me. Okay, so um, we got to talk, bring it up to more modern day. I mean, we do need to talk about President Obama before we get to Trump. But so, so he, I mean, I think just sort of practically, this is not shocking to learn that the first serious, you know, black candidate for president was, being threatened, I mean, basically from the minute he started running. Um, What do you think was so extraordinary about, was it the nature of the threat, the number of the threats? Like, why did the government agree to give Obama protection? I think a full two years before the election. It was a year, and I want to say this right, I want to say it's a year and nine months, but I'll, I'll double check. It was the earliest anybody uh, as a candidate has gotten protection. Typically, it would be kind of like after the spring primaries, the major p- candidates who are coasting towards being the nominee or are battling it out with one other person as the nominee would get protection. This was freakishly early. It was engineered by the all-time power broker, Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader. He um, not 
not entirely secretly, but he was trying to keep it a secret that he was rooting for Obama, thought that Obama would win, did not think Hillary Clinton would, thought her baggage um, was too high. And of course, he's Democratic Senate Majority Leader. He wants a Democratic president. So he also thinks Secret Service protection is going to elevate Obama's um, star. And they also happen to be seeing chatter on uh, nationalist and uh, domestic extremist sort of strains of group chats and web web rooms where people are talking about making sure that black guy, and they don't use the word black guy, they use other words, um, doesn't get to be the nominee. When Obama is the nominee, the threats go through the roof. And until he is inaugurated, uh, the director of the Secret Service is getting kind of sweaty palms about this because it's somewhere on the order of three times as many threats against um, a president-elect or an incoming president. And it, it's very worrisome. Of course, it is historic. He's the first black president. And uh, this is sort of like the nightmare come true for white supremacists. And they're using all sorts of um, very violent language to describe how they're going to block this. I mean, obviously, nobody was successful, but you detail just like, I mean, it's almost... It's, it's, it's upsetting to, to read through this and, and, you know, read about the 2014 incident where the White House was shot at. And then, of course, the hookers and uh, drinking in Columbia. I mean, is that direct evidence of what you kind of laid out in terms of, you know, the lack of professionalism and downfall after 9-11? Like how, like, how do we get in this moment where you have both the most threatened president ever and yet these huge lapses? You know, when you put it like that, it, it, it makes me, it reminds me of a conversation I had with an agent who said when the Obamas were leaving, like, oh my gosh, I feel so lucky. <laughs> I feel like they're so lucky. Like they got out alive um, because the secret service was not disintegrating, but it was unraveling in a lot of ways during Obama's presidency. It wasn't his fault, but, you know, as I said, after 9-11, all this, all these billions, tens of billions of dollars that are invested by our government in fighting terror in the skies, stopping terrorists from coming into the country by boat, by truck bomb by, you know, all of these, all of these methods to harden our borders and protect us from another 9-11 or any other version of it, shortchanged the Secret Service, which is now after 9-11 part of the Department of Homeland Security. And, you know, just because they became part of another department that's huge wasn't the issue. The issue was they weren't pushing hard enough for the money they needed to move into the 21st century. But all those other agencies, Congress was just funneling money to them left and right. The president makes requests. Congress would give those other terror fighting agencies more money than the president requested. And you know who that came out of the pocket of? The Secret Service. So that's one thing. The other thing is the Republicans in Congress uh, in during Obama's presidency, very much at the beginning, strike a deal for how to cut back on the cost of the, of the executive and the federal government. And it's basically like slicing off certain amount of budget off the top every year. You know, for a big agency, might not feel it. Coast Guard, Pentagon won't miss a couple hundred billion. <laughs> but the Secret Service, uh, as one director told the budget office, Director Pearson, she showed up on her first, almost her first day on the job and said, I need to declare bankruptcy. We do not have enough money to do our job. Uh, and you got to get me a lot of money really fast because I've looked it over and it, and we, we, we can't stay above water like this. So the lack of funding is huge. The mission still huge, not going away. Getting bigger, arguably with, I mean, another, you know, at, somebody asked about tech, cyber attacks, like how, like it's, it, it's sort of exponentially growing, right? The threats. Yeah. Totally. The th threats are growing, the sophistication level of some of these things. And, you know, you have the first black president. So you're not. And I have to say, the first lady also a rock star. She draws, you know, agents have told me that Michelle Obama drew as many crowds as he did. So 
that's another stressor. You want to protect her properly, but the Secret Service hadn't had a first lady like Michelle Obama before, and that was expensive. You know, hats off to them for for putting the resources in to protect her. A couple times it didn't go exactly right, but um, like when an intruder got all the way up to the floor of her hotel room in Beverly Hills when she was there with her daughters, they just didn't have enough people to man, enough agents and officers to man all the entrances. And in 2010, somebody got close to her door and, you know, luckily an agent was manning it and stopped him. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and I find it so interesting you detail that, I mean, that was one of her big hesitations for Barack Obama running. She knew this was going to be the case. She was worried about his safety, about her family's safety. Um, and the, yeah. so it's sort of chilling to think about. I mean, you know, I think as journalists, we think in those black and white terms, but there's so many considerations. Um, this is a quick question, but what's the significance of hand on the shoulder an audience member asks? I've heard that used several times. Um, it's just a position that I've no, um, that agents often take in a crisis. You, if you watch some tapes of especially the 2016 campaign, you will see agents um, use their hand, usually on the protectee's um, right shoulder, to push that person forward. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a cute thing that I, you know, think about how close an agent and a president have to be. But when Hillary Clinton was campaigning. Um, you couldn't see it because the video is staring forward at, at the candidate, but agents often had their hand on her belt loop, basically to make sure she didn't pitch forward anywhere. And, and also so they could yank her back if necessary from any danger. Um, there've been a couple belt loop incidents, but um, <laughs> you'll see that, um, that arm on the shoulder. And if you look at the tapes of January 6th, you'll see, uh, Tim Geibel's, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name pro properly, my brain is fried. You'll see his arm on Pence's shoulder as they go down the stairs. And in his other arm, he's talking into his microphone on his wrist. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to just spend a few more time, minutes on Obama because we got to talk about Trump. There's so much there. Um, but Colombia. OK, so like we don't have to, to go. It's it's kind of like a more in-depth story than I realize. Pick up the book if you're interested. But <laughs> Essentially, a lot of agents in security end up going out, drinking, going home with ladies. Um, There's a lot of detailed uh, romance in that part of the book. Yeah, yeah let's, let's very, put it that way. Um, and it unravels because essentially one of the, I believe, more senior agents basically refuses to pay the woman or pay her enough that went home with her. And she tells hotel security and the police. Um, and this launches this huge, you know, international drama essentially, which we all read about, but t talk about the takeaway from that. I mean, it was obviously a huge embarrassment for both the service and the white house, but it also just sort of tore the top off of, you know, a culture that I think we're talking about more in law enforcement generally, right? This like old boys club, heavy drinking, womanizing, and then we can get into the racism aspect, which is another, but like, I mean, what, what was the, the fallout of that kind of within the service? So this moment, you know, of course I write a book that goes all the way back to Kennedy, but really this is the moment that I enter the secret service story and what, propelled me into this unusual beat. <laughs> uh, nobody really has the secret service as a beat. I, uh, I kind of, kind of uh, don't know how I, I do know how I felt. Like you might it. need secret service protection now, but that's. <laughs> Hope not. Um, this was the most considered the most humiliating scandal for the secret service in its history except for Kennedy's assassination. Right. I mean, that humiliating, that bad. Um, Congress began an investigation. The White House began an investigation. Um, an inspector general or two began investigations. Every department that had somebody in Cartagena, the Pentagon, the State Department, uh, every department was looking at, do we have guys or, that were embroiled in this? And yeah, they actually did. Huge, huge, huge problem. And I was just asked, hey, can you figure out like 
what the heck happened down there. A colleague of mine broke the story, but we knew there was a lot more to it and we wanted to figure it out. And it led to me meeting a lot of agents, meeting a lot of their friends, and then meeting more agents, and then meeting more former agents. And my takeaway is now that it was a lot more complicated than just a sex scandal. I mean, a bunch of guys saw an international trip as kind of a, again, a time to blow off some steam. International trips especially, or trips to faraway places had become like a perk for the incredibly grueling job that they did. They sacrificed so much. I'm not saying that they get prostitutes as repayment, but I'm saying that this is how they started to view yeah. it. And it, they're in a small subset of the Secret Service, again, an alpha male organization in many ways. They developed a wheels up, rings off culture. Some of these people, including the one whose decision making was so poor and led to the whole scandal actually coming becoming public some of them were living double, double lives they had you know a wife and a brick rambler in annapolis with two boys and went to church and then they had a million girlfriends on the road or a lot of um steady one night stands wherever they wherever they were in port with the president and this had been tolerated for years when the director was called to testify about this nightmare scenario, he acted very shocked, like, oh, my goodness gracious, there's gambling in the casinos. And in fact, this what I learned was it had been going on for a long time. And the takeaway for me is there's a really sad story, which is one of the people who gets caught um, a divorced man who's single, who's taking advantage of a legal prostitution sex worker culture in South America, uh, but while he's on Secret Service duty, he um, he tells the Secret Service leadership, oh, no, oh, no, 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 we're not going to fire me for things that I know other people have done many times before and gotten a pat on the back. Um, we're not firing me because the director wants to save his job. I'm going to start telling everybody how frequently this has happened before and how much worse uh, other incidents have been. Um, and it starts a real civil war inside the Secret Service. All right. Well, we only have about 15 minutes left and we do have to talk about President Trump. Um, Sorry. So, no, it's my fault. I, I was too obsessed with I love the history stuff. Right. Um, so I guess just talk about like when we get to Trump, who's such an unusual um, campaigner and, and person and president. That's my nice term. Um, unusual. Um, <laughs> how does, I mean, how does the job change for the secret service and, and how does like the kind of interpersonal relationships change? Because it seems like, um, Trump and some of his family member, well, it's, you can talk about this, but like th th it wasn't always the sort of same as previous presidents. There are a lot of things that happen on the Trump presidency related to the Secret Service. Um, you know, probably the most damaging thing that happens is that, you know, the Secret Service is on a downward slide. It had this horrible epi series of Keystone Cops events during Obama. And it's like trying to recover as Obama's leaving. But President Trump doesn't pick up the baton. And I'm not blaming him for everything that happens with the service, but um, he doesn't care about, you know, a strategic mission for the Secret Service or really for any of the other agencies. Governing is not his focus. His focus is on image, optics, and um, ultimately deploying each of the agencies at his disposal for his political gain. So the Secret Service just becomes kind of his political tool. And in fact, it is the most politicized under Donald Trump in modern times. And Nixon might be... Um, a close to similar comparison. Uh, but that's the that's how far back you have to get to see a president using this protective team in this in this kind of craven way. He uses them to um, create images of himself as super strong, helping them, deploying them to clear Lafayette Square of Black Lives Matter protesters on June 1 so that he can march across and, and look like the law and order president. He films a campaign video and, and other sort of still images to show his strength against the protesters. Those protesters were forcibly removed with rubber bullets and and wax from um, all sorts of different uh, 
blunt instruments, uh, shields, etc. And uh, Secret Service, some of them were really disturbed because they're trained to honor peaceable protests, the First Amendment rights that Americans have. But um, in this instance, they were used this way. But not everybody was turned off by Trump within the service either, right? I mean, there are people who really like that. I mean, one guy went and worked as a political advisor. Was he on leave from the Secret Service? I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah. Good, good eye uh, expression, because that's exactly how so many <laughs> agents and especially alumni feel. And the, the agency is, always has said, you know, the people elect them, we protect them. They're supposed to be politically removed. You're not defending and rooting a, for a party. But with, with Trump, many of his detailed leaders did like his agenda, did like his conservative positions on crime, on Black Lives Matter, uh, ignoring it, on... Um, on immigrants. So they leaned his way. That's okay. But they started to express it in different ways. Um, And the detail leader, Trump made him his White House deputy chief of staff, who helped plan that Lafayette Square clearing, helped plan all his campaign rallies, helped, you know, helped him basically seek reelection as a political advisor. That uh, detail leader, Tony Ornato, was just basically on detail to the White House still working and getting paid by the Secret Service. Mm. And he's now an assistant director. He's very close with the current director, Jim Murray, um, who installed him in that you know, job, who promoted him when he returned. So, um, I mean, how should we feel about that then? This is supposed to be a nonpartisan law enforcement agency. Um, we know, I mean, you've alluded to the events of January 6th, but I think that 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 combined with the Lafayette Square event really started unearthing some of the extremism and other and racism within the ranks. I mean, I don't know. Should we should we be worried, Carol? (laughs) You know, there's a agent um, who used to run Vice President Biden's a a senior supervisor on Vice President Biden's detail. And um, he has said this publicly uh, that. For years, he has been warning all sorts of military and law enforcement agencies that they have domestic extremism in their ranks and they have to do something about it. You know, it's one thing for everybody to have different political views uh, about how to solve our immigration issues, about how to deal with criminal justice reform or, or tighter criminal punishment. It's, but it's a whole nother thing for Secret Service agents on the president's detail, as I discovered from their colleagues, to take to social media to cheer on the rioters of the Capitol, to to stoke the conspiracy that Biden may not be a a legitimately elected president. That kind of extremism uh, really made the Biden administration or the incoming Biden administration very worried. And uh, I think it should make us all worried that, that that kind of thing is encouraged or, or at least uh, overlooked by the leadership of those agencies. So is there a way the Biden administration and I mean, because given you're saying that, you know, somebody who was not hiding the fact that he was on some, you know, a president's political team is still in the upper echelons of service. I mean, what can an administration do? And because it strikes me that one sort of through line of all of this, in addition to like presidents just not wanting, you know, the service in the shot is that they don't want to be seen as necessarily like advocating for more money for their own protection. I mean, there seems to be this very like hands off, like, well, that would look bad, which is, you know, kind of crazy because to your point, they're not protecting the person, they're protecting the office, right? They're protecting our democracy. Yeah, yeah but it's, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. Like when the Secret Service and the military are working together to roll out a new beast, you know, the limousine that has all these incredible features and weighs like a zillion tons, um, but has these features to protect the president from any kind of attack. Whenever they talk about upgrading it or upgrading Marine One, the helicopter, which they should upgrade, um, you know, the price tag is always seized upon and they start talking about, wow, the president's helicopter and the president's limo. And it becomes associated with like, wow, it's really pricey. This guy gets a lot of good stuff. This happened to Nancy Pelosi as well. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And um, you don't want to think that someone's going to attack the president and kill him who's a voter. 
but a lot of people have tried right. and we just have to accept that that's part of what we do to protect democracy and presidents. I have to say, if I, if I, if president Biden were sitting here today, here's what I would say, you know, stop worrying about how it looks for you and start worrying about the overworked freaked out agents who think they can't do their job with the tools they currently have. Think about the public servants who are not able to beg you, uh, but they're begging you through me. <laughs> yeah. I only have room for a couple more questions. Um, so I'm going to make this one, let's do this one quick, but uh, an audience member wants to know who pays for the protection of former presidents. I think that's something people are curious about. Um, the Secret Service pays for the protection of former presidents, and that means the U.S. taxpayer pays. Um, former presidents are protected for life, as are their wives now, and um, they can waive it, meaning they can sign something that says they won't take that protection anymore. Some have tried that. Uh, the Carters, I believe, tried that at some point. Um, but we pay for it. Yeah. Um I, I can answer this. Are there any women in the president's detail? Um, I mean, there's definitely women in the Secret Service. There are women in the Presidential Protection Division. Uh, there aren't a lot. Uh, in fact, I, I think if the most recent numbers suggest that there are something like 18% of the Secret Service uh, staff are women, and it's a smaller number. If I'm, if I'm, I have to look at the updated numbers. A smaller number for the agents that are women. Um. All right. We probably only have time for one or two more questions. So I want to talk about, you know, in Congress this week, we saw a very close vote um, with the Republicans whipping votes against a commission to investigate January 6th. Um, I mean, we can tie this to the Secret Service, but I know you've been covering this more broadly. Also, I, I, you know, putting aside maybe some of the more extremism, though, I'm just wondering, like, what you think not just members of Congress, but the Secret Service agents who responded that day, Capitol Police. Um, I mean, I've seen some letters from their union. It, it, it's, this has become so political. And I would imagine that for law enforcement, that's very alarming and disappointing, probably. I think it's so disheartening for Capitol Police officers. Um, there's one in particular, uh, Michael Falcone, who you know, almost had a heart attack, a uh, very fit young man, actually. I mean, not young, but young, relatively speaking, um, almost had a heart attack uh, trying to get away from a mob on the Capitol grounds that day. And, uh, you know, he's beside himself that nobody wants to investigate this. The family of Capitol Police Officer Leibengood, who took his life after this episode, um, after this storming of the Capitol, they have today asked for this commission to go forward. They want answers. They have lost a loved one because of this attack on our democracy, because ultimately that's what it was. Um, there was no way the Capitol Police could stop, you know, 10 to 8,000 uh, rioters, some of them armed with pipes and, um, you know, fire extinguishers and bear spray. Uh, but they want answers about how this could have happened to them. And, and lost them, some of their colleagues. Thank you to Carol Lenning, author of our new book, Zero Fail, The Rise and Fall of the Secret Service. Uh, we'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Marisa Lagos. Thank you and stay safe and healthy. Marisa, thank you so much. Thank you, Commonwealth Club.